worked with the local carpenters union, we worked with youth built to build the community garden and our youth grow farm. So having it on private, a mix of private and public, is also part of the community. So yeah, some of the uh, benefits um, of urban farming is, is economic. You definitely can be an income generating initiative. Uh, it also builds community, builds relationships. I hear a lot of, with this Grant Square project over the summer, it was really exciting just to hear the, the community gardeners say, oh, I'm like meeting my neighbors for the first time. And that's like a big part of it. It, it really goes beyond the actual technical skills of gardening. And it's really building community and feeling, you know, building investment, um, which is just, it's exciting because we all think, oh, well, I don't know how to garden, and you know, that's usually a um, barrier, but then there's so much more to it. Uh, and health, increasing access to healthy food and teaching people how to grow is a big part of it. Um, and encouraging people to eat more fruits and vegetables. And then in turn, just creating, you know, those training stewards of the environment. If you're growing food, you, and you're feeling more comfortable where your food's growing, you're growing in an ethical practice, then you're more likely to care for the envir your environment and the environment around you, which is a byproduct. So in Worcester, there are a few different things going on. Um, at the REC, like I briefly mentioned, there's like community gardens and school gardens. So there's about 64 gardens total. So 43 community gardens across the city and 20 school gardens. So that's pretty exciting. And then we have our youth growth program. And our youth growth program coordinates two urban farms, one on Maine, on Orient Street, uh, Orientic, and then our, our new Grant Square farm in the Bell Hill neighborhood. Then we also have a farmer's market, which is at the YMCA every Saturday, 10 to 2. And we just launched our mobile market, which makes stops uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, five different stops all across the city. So that's another thing about you know bringing food to people and making it accessible. Uh, that's one of our major programs and it's an exciting project. There's also the Green Hill Farm, a back Green Hill Park, and then there's like home gardens as well. Um, that, like I said, are part of the landscape. Uh, so yeah, this is sort of a breakdown of our, our program with the REC. So we organize ourselves into two separate programs, the Environmental Health and Justice Program and the Food Justice Program. Uh, and we're just mainly going to go over the components of our food justice program just because of time. So we've been around for a long time. I'll get into a little bit of the, the details, but we're kind of short for time. Uh, so this is our, our staff. We have about 12 people now. It's a mix of uh, AmeriCorps volunteers and then um, our youth workers as well. Our assistant youth coordinators and our assistant youth, far um, assistant youth farm managers. Yeah, so the mission of the REC, or at least our food justice program, is to increase accessibility to healthy food through location, affordability, and empowerment. Um, so location, I just think of, I just want to talk this out a little bit. Um, I think of our mobile market. So we're trying to make food accessible uh, in, by just bringing it to where people are at. Uh, and in terms of affordability, working with farmers to um, provide affordable pricing and then also offering different forms of payment. So, you know, people can come with cash, they can come with check, they can come with debit, credit, and they can also pay with WIC coupons and EBT. And that just makes it more accessible um, to, for people to pay with all types of payment. And then some of the cornerstones of our program are youth employment, self-sustainability, and grassroots organizing. And we're operating under the principle that food access is a human right and that these disparities in access are within our community. So traditionally, or typically, um, in communities of color, low-income communities, the access to good stuff like healthy air, healthy food, open spaces, is generally disproportionate than in rural communities and affluent communities. So we're trying, to, and we bear the burden more, generally. So we're trying to sort of fight that injustice by providing access to healthy food, by providing, you know, working with other organizations to provide more green spaces and, and build that community around those initiatives. So some of our current projects that are working towards those goals are Youth Grow, you Grow Community Gardens Network, our mobile markets, and then we also have uh, Cooking Matters Cooking Classes. 
So Grace and Mackenzie are going to talk a little bit about Sutra. So I don't want to take too much time going into the nuts and bolts of how our program works. So I'll just quickly um, say what Youth Grow is, and then we wanted to share a little bit um, some challenges that we've had in urban agriculture, specifically relating to our program with working with youth. And Mackenzie's going to talk a little bit about how we try to address some issues of social injustice through our hiring processes and through the way we make decisions. Um, so Youth Grow is an urban agriculture program that's loosely based off the food project. Um, we employ 32 teens um, in Worcester, predominantly from the main south and the Bell Hill neighborhood, and we work on two different urban farms. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've expanded to a year-round program. So during the academic year, um, we shut the farm down in the fall, and we plant a, a greenhouse that we're able to use at Blake Cross in the spring. But we also um, work on educational projects and other initiatives, um, like our own cooperative business. We run a hot sauce business, which I gather I was featured in a video this morning. Embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but we have our hot sauce here. It's a, a value-added product that the youth in our program make with produce that we're able to grow on our farms um, when it's seasonally avail available, but we also can make it year-round. And then the youth are able to sell, and that income um, that's generated from us is one step that we're trying to move toward um, financial sustainability. Right now, our program relies really heavily on funding from the state youth works to pay all the youth in our program. Um, we believe really strongly that youth employment is really important and that paying youth is an important component, but it is a big financial drain. So initiatives like this are ways that we can move toward being more sustainable um, and keeping the money within our community. So I just have a few photos of you. Yeah. Um, we're all very attractive. <laughs> uh, and then we spend the summer, we work on uh, an urban farm um, on Oria Street that's very close to here that we've had for a while. Um, we don't own any of our land, so we use that land uh, through an agreement with the owner, it's a private property owner. Um, and then our second farm, which is in Bell Hill, we originally started um, on church property that we used that was on Greerview Road. And we farmed that property for a few years, and then the congregation decided that they would rather use it um, for evangelical purposes, and so the farm was taken away from us. And so then we spent a year with no land, and then this year we broke ground through a partnership with the Parks Department at Grant Square. But I think that that's a really critical piece of talking about urban agriculture is land and land ownership and land use. And I know um, a lot of people here have different experiences. I know Emily has experience with losing land. Um, I know Amanda has experience with different agreements for having land. So I think that's something that we can come back to talking about um, in more detail, challenges and successes and strategies for moving forward. Um, um, so I want to, before we move on from Youth Grow, pass it off to Mackenzie to talk a little bit about how we make our hiring decisions in Youth Grow. Um, we do have a lot of applicants for our positions, and so we try to be really intentional about how we make the decisions and the process that we use to come to it, um, which I think is, is relevant to what we're talking about here today. So I'm going to have Mackenzie describe that a little bit. So every summer we have, well, spring. spring. We have about 100 to 200 applicants for Youth Girls Summer Program, and we have 32 spots, which is extremely difficult. And um, one thing that's very unique about Youth Girl is we do all the hiring as youth. All the youth do the hiring. So um, we use factors like um, we use factors like. The community, are they in the community? Um, do they have other, other opportunities to job? Um, All the youth in our program also income qualified, so we hire like low income youth, but um, also we uh, use base criteria based on the like, qualities of the candidate, if they're really ready for this job, if they're going to do well, but also the other shining factors in their life. If this program can be, really make a difference for them, if they're going to be able to bring it back and share it with the people in the neighborhood. Um, and then we can talk a little bit. So then we come together uh, as a group of youth leaders and junior staff, and then we sit down for about sometimes two days, but we generally want to use like one day to sit down and go over all the applicants for each campus and then discuss um, 
who do we think would make a good team? Not only is this person doing a good job, but is this good? This person gonna work well with others? What can they bring to the table? What can we help them with? Um, and that's pretty much it. It can be extremely difficult sometimes. Like we have usually 20 returning youth, so 